This is Palm Sunday. We celebrate the arrival of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, into Jerusalem as we enter into the Holy Week. Um, that time between his entrance and his uh, arrest, death, the trial, death, crucifixion, resurrection, all the things that are going to take place. And so this morning we're going to read Psalm 118, verses 22 through 29. I will also be looking at some gospel passages. I'll put them up here that deal with this. But I want, if you would stand with me this morning as I read God's word. The psalmist writes, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do say, we beseech you, O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us life. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I pray that we go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that through this word, Lord, you would speak to us, each and every one. And we thank you for the privilege we have of celebrating this blessed event and the celebration for the week that's ahead of us. And we thank you, Lord, because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice. He's our sacrifice. For that, Lord, we will always be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Uh, yeah, this morning I decided to go ahead and, and look at the psalmist's words. We'll look, like I said, we'll look at some past, couple passages in Matthew, a couple verses, one in John as well. But I was uh, thinking about this idea and, and you know, the event that took place and celebrate, of course, Palm Sunday. And, in years past, some of you might have been at, at churches where they gave up palm branches and things like that, you know, to, to celebrate the, the day and the event. Um, we didn't do that. So, uh, you know, passed a couple of houses on the way that had palm trees, but I thought they might frown on me going and cutting their branches off and bringing them in. What are those for? For a church. I don't know how well that would necessarily fly with the owner. So, so we just decided, you know, well, we, can, we can still celebrate, amen? amen? And next week, breakfast. <laughs> Get called a sunrise service. It's nine o'clock. So, how many have ever attended sunrise services? Before? Yeah. Okay. You're not expecting one next week, right? Okay. Good. Okay. Because I'm not very sunny at that time of day. So, um, so we'll just uh, meet for breakfast and then we'll have a service. And I am expecting wonderful things next week as well. I'm, I'm excited about what God is going to do. I'm excited about what what He has called us to do as a body of believers in the church, and I look forward to seeing what. Um, the future holds for us. But this morning we're going to talk about this event that, that takes place. Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on a colt, royally yet humbly, to the rejoicing of his followers, but provoking the opposition from the Jewish leaders. When Jesus rode in, uh, he rode into town, and of course everybody was excited because here came Jesus, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the Messiah, as some would, would view it, uh, this this. Uh, king, possibly, of uh, the people, this deliverer of the people, and, and there just seems to be this idea of, 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 of I don't want to say it this way, mob excitement. You know how it is. It's like you get into a group and there's probably people there throwing branches and coats down have no idea why they're doing it. Just, why are you doing this? Everybody else is. It's what we do, right? And I think it'll be that same mob mentality that a week later will say crucify him. There will be those of the holler out there, crucify him, and have no idea what they're talking about. But they'll do it anyway, because that's what the group and the mob is doing. And I think this is part of what's taking place here. And yet at the same time, we do find this idea of a proclamation being made uh, regarding this, this individual that's riding on this donkey, on this cult, Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about the proclamation of, of, of who this is. The proclaiming that goes forth, the, the, the hosannas and the shouts and the, 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 the joy and all that that's taking place there. And so there are three things, three proclamations that I want us to look at this morning. And the first of these, of course, is what we refer to as a proclamation of kingship. 
Matthew 21, 8 says, Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from trees and spreading them in the road. You see, the idea here is that the people recognized Jesus as the king. They recognized him as king. In calling Jesus the son of David, the people recognized him as the long-promised Messiah. And without clear apprehensions of what his work was to be, they could rejoice in the realization of their national hope. They had gone a long time without having the, the, the privilege of having a king, uh, a true king, within the, within the lineage of David over the nation, over the people. And they saw the Messiah as that one who would come and who would deliver them. He would be the one that they rec would recognize as king. And they would see him as such. Their joy made it clear to the Jerusalem officials, however, that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. There, would be, there could be no mistake. They must accept or reject the claim. And this will become the issue that will lay the groundwork for the coming week. The people rejoiced. <coughs> Excuse me. The religious leaders did not. They were apprehensive. They were they expected to become angry. Uh, if you go through this week and you study the, the events that take place over the next several days, you're going to find that the, uh, they, they, they didn't need ground and justification for what they were about to do. They just decided with amongst themselves that there was a reason for doing it and they would make it so. It is significant to note that up to this point in the Gospels, Jesus has avoided any call or display of, of the public to his kingship. We find other instances in the gospel where it seemed like the, the crowd wanted to, to, to crown him or to bring him forward. He would sneak away or he would uh, shut people down and get them not to, to share this and not to, not to, because the time had not come. But now the time was here. The time was present. Now he had to present himself to the people as the nation's Messiah. It was now time, in the fullness of time, God set forth into motion these events that now were going to culminate within this next week worth of events. And Jesus, while he pretty much shied away from the public's attention and, and from the adoration of the people, now accepted it. It was time. And so he went forward, and again, the idea of riding on a colt, uh, placing uh, you know, himself in this position uh, showed that he was willing to accept this idea of the, the kingship and the authority. You see, the placing of carpet for a king to walk on or ride on was a common practice in which people would pay homage to their ruler. You know, they were they were seen as authority figures, and they should. You know, it wasn't enough for them to ride on the dusty road. So people would take off their cloaks, or they would find branches, and they would lay them before them as a sign of honor to the individual as they rode into town, and in essence, praising them for their position of authority. Again, a visible sign that Jesus did not shut them down or allow not allow them to represent, but a sign that would eventually again would be a physical sign to the religious elites of his day that wait a minute, this guy is stepping out. He's now making something known that, that you know, we have kind of worried about this. Okay, now he's, he's putting him in a position where they, they can't just stand in the, in the shadows and worry about it. They now have to begin to react or to act upon uh, what's taking place here. So this is what's taking place as, as they lay them before Jesus. They acknowledge Jesus' kingship. Now, while this takes place among the people, what they recognize, we need to realize that believers, while uh, it's not enough for us to recognize the king, believers need to worship the king. You see, what, what will take place here is that, again, the people recognizing who Jesus is, but for us, it's not, not just enough to recognize. We have to worship him. It's not to say I recognize him as the Son of God. I must worship him as the Son of God. It's not enough to recognize him as king over all of creation. I must worship him as king over all creation. The world is filled with people that recognize Jesus for who he is and choose not to worship. And we cannot do that. We must be careful and we must realize the significance and the importance of this. We must accept or reject the kingship of Jesus Christ. And there's no middle ground. There, that's all we can do. We're either going to do one or we're going to do the other. And so this morning, the challenge is for us to accept the kingship of Jesus Christ. To accept His authority as our Savior and Lord. 
as the Son of God and the redemptive work that he did. The second thing that we see here is a proclamation of Messiahship. Matthew 21, 9 said, The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You see, the people welcomed the Messiah. They weren't just welcoming a king. They were welcoming the Messiah. Now realize, for them, Messiah and king were, were tightly connected. The Messiah would be a, a, a ruler in the line of David, from the lineage of David. And David was the king. He was pretty much their warrior king. He was the one that, that delivered them from the hands of their enemies, that established Jerusalem as the holy city, and, and, and did all of these things, and, and, and made the nation what it was in his day. And this is what they were looking for. They were looking for another David. The people recognized him as the long-promised Messiah, and without clear apprehensions of what his work was to be, they could rejoice in the realization of a national hope. This idea of nationalism, a strong nationalism that took place, that they said, we will now become God's people. We will now be reestablished as, as, as the nation of Yahweh, the, the people of Yahweh, the, the, everything that... that God promised Abraham will now come to fulfillment. So they have a long history that they're building on here. And although the, the term Hosanna was originally a cry for help, it eventually became an invocation of praise. If, if we look at the word Hosanna, it really means God save. And this is what they were saying. They wanted God to save them. We had a couple choruses this morning and, and with, with the words Hosanna in it. I, I, I think about that and I think, okay, wait a minute. When we're, when we're singing Hosanna, we're talking about, we're singing songs of praise to God. I don't think any of us out here this morning were saying, uh, Hosanna, God save us. But that was the intent, that was the idea. The latter of which of these, the idea of praise, uh, we see here from the people as it's gone through the generation and it's changed the psalmist and, and what he was seeing as Hosanna, Hosanna was very different than what we would see the people see in Jesus' day. And so the idea here of, of praising Jesus as, as the Messiah. Likewise, the term Son of David was a Messianic term in which the people were expressing the kingly role of Messiah, the Messiah would play. Again, he wouldn't just be a, a Messiah um, as far as the Son of God, he would be that one, or you know, then he would be that one that would deliver them. He would be the king. And they saw this idea, it was the idea of the Son of David. Messianic in nature, a messianic term. They were looking for this Messiah who would come and deliver them again from the hands of their oppressors. And while the people needed to uh, or while the people welcome the Messiah, the believers, as believers, we don't we need to more than just welcome him, we need to receive him. Uh, think about it, uh, you know, the, the idea here. We must recognize Jesus as Messiah in our lives. And to, cho to choose not to do so is to re reject his redemptive work at the cross. And what we celebrate this week is, is the idea of receiving. You know, Ken made a couple comments there about the, the two holy days of, of the church, Christmas and Easter. Okay, in the, in the past we've, uh, we've, we've heard the term C and E's. Do we have the term CNEs? Yes. Right? So, yeah, the CNEs. So the CNEs, uh, they, they will honor and celebrate those holy days. So what they're doing, I believe, is they're, they are recognizing and welcoming uh, the, the concept of the idea of Jesus in his role, but they're not receiving it because to receive it is to say that Jesus is my Messiah, not just on Christmas, not just on Easter, but 365 days a year. 366 on leap year. For those that want to question me afterwards, don't get into the number of 365.25 or anything like that. You know what I'm talking about. All right? I know some of you out there were already planning. Okay, stop. No need to plan. So we need to receive the Messiah. We need to receive him into our lives. We need to accept him. We need to, we need to live our lives in honor of him. Don't just welcome him in. Receive him. How many of you ever had a someone come to your house as a, to, to visit you and you welcome them into your home but you really didn't want them there? 
Anybody? Just me? Come on, be honest now. It's not confession time. But there are certain people that if they came to your house, you would receive them gladly. You're excited to see who they are. You, you do more than just welcome them in. Like you, the, the person you welcome in, you might just kind of sit down and say, you want a glass of water? Okay. Uh, the person you receive, say, hey, I've got some snacks in the fridge. I've got some cold stuff. I've got some chips. I've got some you know, soda over here. You want to make a pot of, put on a pot of coffee? There's a, there's a whole different attitude that we have for those that we freely receive than those that we just welcome. Don't we? And so we need to do more than just welcome him. We need to receive him with joy and with gladness because of who he is. Because of what he means to us. It's important that we understand this idea here of, and that proclaiming his messiahship is not just to welcome him as messiah, but to fully receive him. And the third thing that we see here is a proclamation of victory. John 12, 13 says, They took palm branches uh, of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even to the, even the king of Israel. You see, the idea here now is that they didn't just um, acknowledge him or whatever and receive him. They, what they did is they claimed his, him as victory. The people proclaimed a victory that they would not understand. I need to clarify that. The people were proclaiming a victory that they had not yet received. I was thinking about this and I was thinking about, you know, I don't watch a lot of NBA. I can watch very little NBA basketball because I think the season's way too long. Okay, it just goes on and on and on. It's agonizing. But I can remember, um, I got a little bit excited last year when the Cavaliers were in the finals. They got down three games to one. Okay? And everybody was proclaiming the victory for, for Golden State, weren't they? Nobody ever come down from a 3-1 deficit. I think the same thing happened in the Super Bowl this past year when the, when, when, when the Patriots got down by a lot of points. Nobody's ever come back from that de this type of deficit. And we have this idea within history. The same thing happened to Indians. They went up 3-1 and lost the World Series. But in history, we have the idea that there are certain elements, certain things we look at and say, okay, this is pretty much an assured victory. Let's proclaim our victory. Okay? And yet, the Warrior fans, the Indian fans, and the... Who did the Patriots beat? The Falcons. The Falcons. Yeah, that was it. Okay, yeah. Their fans were shocked. So were those Alabama fans in that Clemson game, come to think of it. Yes, history is filled with examples of people proclaiming the victory only to stand on the sidelines and go... Tears streaming down their face because their expectations have been shattered on the rocks of life. These people were proclaiming a messianic victory of a ruler king, a warrior king that was going to come and deliver them from their oppressors. The use of the palm branches themselves originated at the Feast of Tabernacles, but it became associated with other feasts by this time. The, ter the, the idea of waving of the palm branches was a sign of honor for someone who is victorious. We do the wave. It began in Jesus. They did the original way, but they used palm branches. Okay? Think about that. Here comes Jesus. Everybody grab your palm branches. Grab your palm branches. Okay, back the other way. All right. Yeah. I know you guys think he's lost it. <laughs> but it was the original way. And what were, they, what were they doing? They were excited because the victorious king was here. This, this statement that is made here is a composite of acclamation drawn particularly from Psalm 118, which we looked at, and, and the prophet Zechariah, where he talks about, uh, where the idea here is that uh, Zion, or Jerusalem, is called upon to rejoice at the coming of their king. And the coming of their king and the Messiah were cause for shouts of victory among the people. They were proclaiming the victory they hadn't received. Sometimes I hear Christians kind of do the same thing. They're proclaiming it. And we say, well, we're proclaiming Jesus' name. Yes, you can do that. I was sharing with my, my class this week, one of my classes in the region, we are talking about prayer. And I said, but we need to realize something. That when we proclaim the victory, sometimes the victory means God doing the opposite of what we want him to do. We don't proclaim victory just because he did it our way. And because then we proclaim defeat when he doesn't do it our way. 
They're proclaiming victory and they're expecting something to happen. And a week later when he's battered and beaten and he's standing before them and, and, he, and he won't open his mouth and defend himself and, and all these things are happening, the group is looking at it and saying, wait a minute, this is, this is no sign of victory. We've been defeated. We had such a big lead. He, he, is, he was our king. He looks nothing like a king. He looks nothing like a Messiah. He's just a man. He can't defend himself. How can he defend us? He can't bring victory over his own life. How can he bring victory over ours? But for believers, we must live the victory. We can't just proclaim it. We must live it. Each and every day we live the victory. You see, through Christ's redemptive work, we, we all experience victory every, each and every day. And as such, we can shout Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord each and every day. The Jesus that was, was your victor yesterday is the Jesus who's your victor today and who'll be your victor tomorrow if we realize what victory is all about. The failure for the people was that victory did not meet their qualifications. And sometimes our greatest defeat is the fact that we, we want to quantify or qualify what victory should be for us as believers. Instead of what God desires it to be. The two holy seasons of the church, Christmas and Easter. For the believer, there, is a, there are a time of celebration. For the lost, they exist for, the gift, for gift giving, egg hunts, things like that. Don't get me wrong, egg hunts are cool. Okay? That's why we're stuffing eggs. Right? You guys have candy for those eggs? You good? Need more? We 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 need more candy, but we because you didn't mention it, so I'm I'm, I'm I'm calling them out now. We'll be here some Wednesday night. You can drop it off, okay? If you want. But my point is, is that we are, and, and this is a time of celebration. But you know what? We've talked about this, and, and what what we believe God wants us to do as a church, and and while we're doing this, and as a time of celebration, all this stuff, there's more to it than that. It's also a time of building relationships. To think that we could exist in this building for over 25 years and not have built a relationship with an entire community is beyond me. Okay, so they, I, I, you know, so I think this is important for us. So people say, well, you know, Easter eggs, that's bad. You can't do that. That's pagan. All that stuff. Let's just, let's just enjoy the, enjoy the time of relationship building and fellowship with one another and with a good community of believers that. Jesus died for. The children of Israel missed the significance of the birth of Christ, of the Christ child. Just a few months ago, we celebrated the birth of our Savior. They missed it. And in the Messiah's entry into the Holy City, they missed it. You see, Easter week is upon us. Let's prepare our hearts for God's blessing as it is experienced through the resurrection of the Lord. And what is God's blessing. God's blessing is not just what he will do for us, but what he will do through us in the lives of others. And I've heard it said so many times over the year. What a wonderful celebration. If, you, if someone comes to church on Christmas or Easter and accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, you know what? That is a wonderful celebration. That's a, that's a, a point of reference for them. I could not tell you because of why it wasn't Christmas, Christmas or Easter for me. It was just an experience I had in church one Sunday night. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Could I give you a date on that? Could I give you a day? No. But I can tell you what. I remember the event. It doesn't matter whether it's Christmas or Easter. Any time over the course of a 12-month period, any day of the week, any hour of the day. If someone comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's an exciting experience. We don't have to say, oh, wait a minute, it's, Friday. it's Good Friday. If you could just hold off till around 10.30 on Sunday morning, we could pray for you, and you'll have Easter as your point of reference for the rest of your life as to when you accepted Jesus as Savior. Let's just be excited for the fact that God has called us to be used by Him to reach the lost, to, to bring them to an understanding of, of not the event, but the significance of the event. 
It's more than just a resurrection. It's an event that draws us to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they need Christ. So this morning I ask, does your heart shout, Hosanna? Is your faith in the soon coming King? Is Jesus Christ your Savior? If not, there's no better time than the, than the present to accept Him as Lord. And again, it's not because it's Palm Sunday, it's because there's no better time. This is the moment. This is the time. Maybe you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior in your life and you're saying, you know what, I just, I, my life is, I, I love the Lord, Jesus is my Savior, but I'm, I'm still got some things that, you know, I'm just struggling with right now. I just need to recommit myself to the Lord, and not just because of sin in my life, but just because of the call on my life. Don't get lost in the crowd. Don't get lost in the excitement and the shuffle of what it's all about. Let's just begin to allow our relationships, that personal relationship, to build one individual at a time. Let's bow our heads. This morning, as we prepare to close, and I don't have any music to play over this, so we'll just go ahead and uh, just allow ourselves to reflect and quietly before the Lord. allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us individually. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are those who receive him in the name of the Lord. We thank God for what he has done through his son Jesus Christ. We thank the Father for, for the, the compassion that he, is, he, is, he has on us. For the son's willingness to sacrifice himself for us. For the spirit's work in working inside in each and every one of us individually. We see the fullness of the Godhead active in our life each and every day. And yet we allow certain situations or events to kind of get in the way. We, 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 we get caught up in the busyness of life. But this morning I pray in Jesus' name that we would begin to allow the Spirit to draw us unto the Father. Allow the Spirit to speak to each and every one of us. Allow the Spirit to speak to you in a way this morning as he hasn't spoken in a long time. Let the Spirit work in you this morning in a way that's new and fresh and special. Let your relationship be personal and not something that results from the crowd. Father, this morning, as we prepare to close our time together, I pray and ask in Jesus' name that you would speak to each and every one present this morning, that your spirit would minister to each and every heart and life, that, Lord, we would begin to see that the greatness of what took place here uh, a, a little over 2,000 years ago, that while the crowd was looking for a Messiah, looking for a king, looking for a victory, they missed completely your intention. Help us, Lord, not to miss that. Help us to see, Father, that Jesus Christ is our King, that Jesus Christ is our Messiah, that Jesus Christ is our victory, and in no other can we find those things but Him. And help us to see, Lord, that as King, Messiah, and Victor, our lives are so tightly connected to His then we can only pray, your will be done. And if there are any here this morning, Lord, that are struggling in, uh, in their relationship with you, they're saying, Father, Jesus is my Messiah. Jesus is my King. 
but I don't have the victory. I pray this morning, Lord, give them the victory. Help them to overcome, Lord, whatever is in their life, whatever we're dealing with, and I pray in Jesus' name. Let them feel the fullness of that victory. If you're here this morning and that's your desire, first, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, He's not your Messiah. But if you choose this morning to do so, I'd like to pray for you. I'm just asking you to raise your hand. To accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah. To accept Him as your King. He, maybe you, He's your Messiah. You accepted Him as your Savior. But you know what? He's not Lord in your life. You're allowing things to interfere with the King's rule. And this morning, if that's the case, then I want to pray for you. I'm asking you to raise your hand. Anyone at all? And finally, maybe you're struggling because, Lord, you, you still have the victory. Too many things are getting in the way. Too many things are, are, are just muddying up the relationship. Uh, you're a child of the king. And yet we're not living as such. And this morning, if you need the victory, I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And you Thank you. Any others? Thank you. He is our victory. And my challenge for each and every one of us today is as we head into this week, some wonderful things are about to take place. And... I, and I'm asking this morning that each and every one of us would make sure to take some time each and every day to pray for this event that's coming up next Saturday. Not that the church would be filled. That would be a blessing in itself, and that's, only, that's all in the hands of God. But that lives would be touched. That Jesus Christ would be felt. That His love would be expressed that those who come into contact who feel they have they, that, that are hurting and in pain would realize that they too can have the victory. Not of this world, but through Christ. Father, as we prepare to leave today, I thank you for those that have acknowledged their need for victory in their lives. And I pray now in the name of Jesus, give them that victory. Holy Spirit, speak to them and show them what you want to do in their lives on their behalf. And we do, Lord, commit this way to you each and every day. Uh, I just ask, Lord, that you would just bless us, each family, each person represented here. Be a blessing to them. Let them live victoriously. And Lord, I pray our commitment to uh, the ministry of this body, Lord, and how you've called us to minister. Give us a vision. Give us guidance. Speak to us, Lord, each one. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week and may the Lord be with you.